like all stories, this one also starts with Once Upon a Time. This story starts millennia ago. And it kind of starts with this guy, who is a famous philosopher, and he's kind of considered the father of modern science to some degree. Uh, the thing that is interesting about Aristotle is that he was quite interested in the soul. Well, he was interested about the soul because um, he had his own definition. And for him, it was the act of a natural body with the capacity for life. Now, the interesting thing about him was that uh, compared to what we have done in more recent centuries in, again, Western culture, it wasn't dualistic about it. It wasn't like, oh, body and soul or, you know, any of that. Actually, he was interested in the fact that the two together make up one substance. And the other thing that he was interested in, and I guess this comes a little bit, uh, emer this is the emergence of the scientific mind in the sense of like uh, boxing and organizing knowledge, which is something that we have become very good at. So he decided that let's create a, a few boxes to distinguish between different souls. And the first one he called the vegetative. And the function of the vegetative soul is just about nutrition and reproduction. Then you have the sensitive soul, and that is the one that perceives and responds to the surrounding environment. And then, of course, the important one, the rational soul, which is apparently the, thing, the, the one that speak and presumably think. Now, it's not difficult to see how the three groups kind of overlap with three hierarchical groups that we can recognize very easily. The first one would have been the plants, then you had the animals, and then the humans. He didn't just um, said, okay, you got plants on one side, animals on the other side, and the human over here. No, he thought, well, okay, the plants are one group, and then the animal is, uh, you know, it contains a particular soul, which is the, the sensitive soul, but it's got the plant soul or the vegetative soul included within. And then the human, by default, includes both of those previous two. Now, so th then something weird happened to this man. Like maybe he quarreled with, with someone or he didn't have a good night's sleep, I don't know. But the f some morning he got up and obviously with the wrong foot and he decided, you know what, we need to separate further these groups. And so just uh, pretty much by randomness, he decided, well, what am I going to pick to just separate these groups? And he decided that sensitivity or insensitivity was a good way to separate the plants from the animals. This is where the science in him, the scientist in him, really fails. <laughs> because it's like, and what, it, what was the criteria for that? No criteria, just because I can, because I'm Aristotle, and everyone that is going to listen to me is going to believe me, and that's exactly what happened. Everyone that came after him for millennia just gave automatically, it, it was assumed that he was right. And the influence of this one man and his, his ideas is still here now, despite many more philosophizing minds throughout history, which is quite cool. If I was Aristotle, I would be very proud of myself. <laughs> now, what in effect happened with this is that whether he meant it or not, but by calling the plants insensitive, well, you're kind of objectifying them. You're saying that they have a soul, but that soul doesn't actually act as life. So you can see how easy it is to then become a nothing of no importance, something that can be replaced, something that can be thrown away easily. Plant, they have a whole suite of different ways of conversing about and showing themselves. They have plenty of stories about light, about darkness. They are good at checking out um, the ratio between red infrared, for example, uh, which is light that is bouncing on and off from neighbors. And based on that, they can tell whether oh, the guy next to me is going a bit fast. And I better check and better keep an eye because uh, I might get overshadowed and then I'm going to die. So I have to modify my growth rate so that I can compensate for that. So there is a constant monitoring in that sense, for example. More recently, with peas, we have seen now how sound actually play a role not only in reproduction, so with the pollinators, not only in defense, but also in the way in which plants can find resources. And of course, one of the resources that plants are after is water. 
plants can detect the source of water at a distance without water being even there, but just the sound of. And so if you can hear it, it will give you a vague idea of the direction. Then as you get closer, you will hit that humidity gradient. It's like, yes, bingo, I got it. And then you can maybe fine tune your growth to the actual source. These are just beautiful, very recent examples of what role sound could play, can play in the life of plants. So basically, all of these communication and sharing of information from different senses is ultimately facilitating, you know, if you're a plant, your ability to thrive. And the best way to thrive, and any system does that, is to learn from your past experience, to remember what happened before so that you don't have to remember every single time. And you can be much better at responding when the thing happened again and again. And this is exactly what we are finding. The plants are really good at learning. So I guess, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this was a very long, millennia long gossip, but unfortunately it wasn't very scientific, wasn't it? It had no reason, no proof, and yet we have believed this story for a very long time. So much so that we have almost, and I say almost, driven the entire planet to the brink of complete destruction. I'd like to finish with this quote because I think it summarizes a lot of my blah blah for the last whatever time. Thank you so much. <laughs>